Hi, my name is Marissa Lester, and today I'm interviewing Harold Tenney. Mr. Tenney, what years did you attend you have Pike College? I started here in the fall of 1970. I just had returned back from a church mission in Guatemala, in El Salvador, and, and attended here from the fall of 71 <clears throat> to the spring of seven, uh, fall of 70, better said, to the spring of 72. And then I went on to four-year college at BYU. So did you... Uh, <clears throat> attain a degree when you were here at Yavapai? I did not. I did it jump through the hoops. There was one other class that I needed to take to get my associate's degree, but since my goal was to go on and get a four-year degree, I chose to leave it the semester, and so I entered BYU in the spring semester of 72. So I didn't get an associate's degree, but I did 10 here, year and a half. Prior to my mission, I went to Mesa Community College for a semester also. So what were you studying? Originally, I wanted to go into counseling and be a psychologist. And then that when I got to Yavapai and had some good teachers here, particularly in political science, I chose to change my, my major to political science. So what do you do today? I'm a school principal at Washington Traditional School. All right. So what <clears throat> um, drew you to Yavapai College? A couple things. Uh, I actually grew up in Prescott, went to school here through 12th grade, and there had been a desire at that time to hopefully get a, a junior college or community college in the Yapai County. And uh, so two reasons, one is economical and one is educational. Came off a mission, had no money left, <clears throat> I was able to live at home, able to get a job at Yapapai, fortunately, and had outstanding teachers and professors. and. I think reflecting back, one of the things I appreciated at the MFI was that the relationship with the, with the professors was much more personable than it was when I got to a four-year college. So smaller class sizes? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how much did a credit hour cost you back then? Oh, you ask me that. Oh, my. Uh, I was taking 16 credits a semester average, probably, and I'm trying to remember but I think it was the total cost was less than $150 for all my credits, for 16 college credits, if I remember right. I think it was $145. I thought that was a lot of money at that time. So uh, how much were your books costing then? Books would run uh, about $12 a book, but when uh, compared that to other books you could buy for $2, so I thought it was highway robbery. Uh, what they were charging us for books. And one of the issues I had is that some of the books you could sell back to the library or to the, excuse me, to the bookstore and others they said, oh, we're no longer going to use them, so you'd have to eat it. So that I think that's probably the same kind of experience today. Oh, it is. Yes. It is. Yeah. So were you involved in any extracurricular activities or clubs? I was. Uh, I was president of the LDSSA, which stood for Latter-day Saint Student Association here on the, at the college, and I was also a member of the College Student Senate. So what did um, the LDS club do? Basically, it was an association of those who were affiliated with the LDS Church, the commonly known as the Mormon Church, a place mm -hmm. to gather and meet and, and, com and share common activities and, and associate. And so did some service projects around the campus, and uh, it was a, a good social uh, club. It was uh, it was probably those kids who had kind of the same values and those kind of things, and so I did that. And then with the Senate, I ran for that, got elected, and was involved in helping make decisions involving student activities here on campus. Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> so, um, were you involved? like maybe in high school in helping form the college? Not directly. My, my father had some real direct involvement here. In fact, you probably saw his name in the library. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that when I was a teenager that we used to pasture horses right on this very property that the campus sits on. We didn't own it. It was state property, state government property, and we had a lease on the property here. So. Uh, then when my dad was in the state senate, uh, he was involved in proposing a bill to get a community college, junior college in Yapai County. But it was a little controversial because uh, the Verde Valley wanted the campus on their side of the mountain, mm -hmm. and Prescott wanted it on this side of the mountain. 
And I don't remember the exact vote, but it was extremely close because the Verde Valley rallied, and I think it was less than one tenth of one percent vote difference. Wow. And if it had gone the other way, then the main campus would have been over in the Verde Valley instead of here. But it ended up coming over on this side of the, the, the hill. So I wasn't directly involved, but I can tell you I was involved because my dad got me involved going out and getting letter sign and, and putting the signs up on the road and those kind of things. So that was my involvement That's from a political point of view. So, um, Just out of curiosity, were you related to Merle Opal Allen? Uh, related to Opal Allen. Merle was her husband. Opal was my aunt. Okay. And so I had no choice because she was involved in getting the, the, the thing going as another citizen. So she was directly involved in getting the campus here. I think she she ran the 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 referendum or the initiative to get the vote of the the electorate here and my dad got involved in the Senate down there getting the funding for the college too. He was chairman of the appropriations committee so he was able to use that that authority of power to get the the college funded for the first few years here. Oh, that's interesting. Was there um a dress code that you had to You know, uh, interestingly enough, there wasn't that I remember a specific dress code, but there was a grooming code. And it was unwritten. And in fact, and I, and I was trying to remember before I came today that the, the young man that was involved in the case study, but it was a national case study. Uh, Dr. Barnes, who was the, the president of the college, came from Texas, had real conservative traditional values. And young men were not to have their hair go beyond the, their, their collars or their ears. And this was a college. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and a young man enrolled in school here, and his hair was long, it was down to here. And the president said, that you either cut your hair or else I'll kick you out of the college. And he said, no, it's my constitutional right to do this. And, and he said, not while well, I'm president, I'm just at mm -hmm. living, but basically. But it went to court, and it, it got appealed, uh, I think, one level or, or maybe up to the state Supreme Court. But it was a national case study for junior colleges. Could they require a dress code as far as grooming is concerned? And the college lost. Uh, they got appealed. They, I think the young man won in the county court, and then it was appealed to the next level by the college, and ultimately to the state level at the Supreme Court, and they ruled in favor of the young man. And I don't remember the case study, but if you go back to 71, Look up Yapa yeah, College versus somebody. I bet you can find that case study. Oh wow! So, and he he kind of look at your shoes. If your shoes weren't polished, he'd remind you to polish your shoes. I remember but it was kind of one of his little peculiarities. He that's what he did. But most of the kids were pretty well groomed. I mean, I not there wasn't a dress code that I can remember per se. Uh, but we were, if you remember, right in the right in the middle of the hippie generation mm -hmm. was going on. So. There, there were a lot of kids who actually weren't going to school here. Were going to, to, at that time, it was Prescott College out at where the Embry Riddle campus is. Okay. And a lot of those kids would come mingled here, and they were certainly of the hippie generation. So you kind of had a more of a traditional student here, and then the kids who were a little more liberal in their their uh, preferences were out there. So did they do um, like? Could you take classes at Prescott College as well, or? I don't know if you could or could not, but I didn't do that. But there were two different populations of kids. And I remember going down, the, you'd, you'd find a lot of them down at the courthouse. I mean, it was kind of like a miniature little, you know, I hate Ashbury in San Francisco. They were down there, and that would cause some of the the, the uh, older people in the community to kind of grumble about those hippies being down at the, at the county courthouse area. We didn't have a lot of that here, but we had a few, and so it was kind of in that transitional time. So, yeah. so you said that you lived at home, but did you have any friends who stayed in the dorms, or I did uh, most of the dorm at that time were kids who had come here via sports scholarships because there was only one dorm at that time. Okay, and and frankly, most of the sports program were imported students from. They're back in the you know in the, in the east and 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 California and otherwise. So I don't know of any local students at that time who were involved in the sports program because it was kind of like we're going to start an instant program, and the college board at that time was very pro athletics, and so they funded full house scholarships for most of those kids. And I feel those uh, students, young men and young women, I got to know, and they were younger than me because you got to remember I went. I was gone for two years and mm -hmm. came back, so I was kind of an older student. 
And so I was more focused on getting getting my first two years done so I could move on. But we did have some friends there that I associated with, and a lot of them come up to my house and hang out because they want to get some home cooking since they didn't get it at the dorm or in the cafeteria. Yeah. So but I think they came because my mom's cooking as much as me. So. <laughs> So, um, then did you eat at the cafeteria any, or? I did. I actually worked in the rec center, which as they called it, which was right next to the cafeteria, and actually were part of the same building. It was the second floor over at the other building over there, and where mm -hmm. we were being interviewed was the college library at that time. Yeah. And so, the rec center, I was responsible for uh, checking out pool equipment, and billiards equipment, and, and, and they had the ping pong table, tennis there, and so. A lot of the kids I got to know there, and the cafeteria was right around the corner, mm -hmm. so I'd obviously go get a lunch there and come and eat there. So, was it good food? It was good food. Yeah, you go to America. Good. I just got back from Guatemala, so oh, American yeah. food was really good food. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what resources were available to you as a student? Were there tutors, or was it? You know, I don't remember any tutor programs going on. I think you probably could have contracted with somebody, but there wasn't any that I can remember of formal organized tutoring program here at the college at that time. So was the library well supplied then, or? Uh, it was adequate. That was, again, that was just at the start of computers. In fact, there was nothing on computers. It was the old-fashioned check it out, the Dewey Decimal System, and, mm -hmm. and everything was, you know, hardbound books and so I don't ever I didn't ever feel like I was being deprived I don't think there was any time that I needed to go elsewhere to get research for my classes and projects so for that day and time it was fine but I'm sure today it's about a hundred times more information to pull from if not thousands of volumes so uh, it was a traditional library very quiet and and uh, did a lot of studying at the library so yeah I thought it was adequate that's cool. So, what was one of your uh, best experiences at YC? I really enjoyed uh, Mr. Duran, who was my biology teacher, and it, I think because it was a transition from the high school, uh, it was more open dialogue as far as students were concerned. It wasn't the teachers, the boss, the students were subservient. There was good dialogue. He had a great sense of humor. I, Actually, for the person I really enjoyed my science classes and uh, and thoroughly enjoyed him as a person besides what he taught in the classroom. So I'd say biology was good. I had others who were excellent teachers. Uh, we had one class was in my political science class, and there was a the the text for the class was I don't remember the name of it. It was about zero population. There was a real move to have not to have kids. I mean, um, it, there was a fear that we are going to overpopulate the world within 10 years. And so the goal was everybody could have only one child, that's similar to what the policy is in China today. Yeah. And uh, there was a strong belief by the professor, and his bias was obvious in his presentation. And I tend to come from a traditional family of eight children, so yeah. I took offense. And I was, since I was older, I would argue with him and, and did it impact my grade. I don't know. I didn't get an A. but. Uh, <laughs> it was a real stimulating class, so there was a lot of dialogue going on, and uh, the older students, I think, were more comfortable doing so. But I enjoyed that class because of the topic. Uh, Mr. Duran was probably my most favorite teacher, though, while I was here at, at Yavapai. So would you mm -hmm. say your, uh, that one class was one of your worst experiences at YC, or...? I don't know if I would say it was worse, because I think that it caused me to do some thinking, do some research, and, and probably to really assess my belief system as far as families, mm -hmm. population, uh, and demographics, and things that deal with worldwide issues. And uh, there were some good things in the class, too. I think there was some desire by the professor to say that the world is shrinking. We all need to be involved in what takes place in Africa as well as Asia, not just in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I concurred with that. It's just that he had a different solution than I was comfortable with. Yeah. And so it was a good class. Uh, classes that I did not think that there were good classes. Honestly, at Yapa, I didn't have the experience. I did have my four year, even at BYU and, and ASU later, is because I felt there was not a relationship with the professors. Whereas here, every one of my teachers, I felt like I could go talk to them and they knew me by name. And it was a case where 
there was some good dialogue. So overall, it was an outstanding experience here at Yavapai. So how many students would you say that there were at Yavapai at this time? Oh, boy. And this is just a guess. I think mm -hmm. you may have to do some research <laughs> on it. But I, it was probably full-time students, I'd say 2,000, with the... And that might be high. That might be 1,500, maybe, to 2,000. Mm -hmm. Part-time students, I think it was up to about 5,000 when you brought all the people in the community. So it, a little smaller atmosphere. I, I knew basically everybody came on campus with it because they, they would come to the rec center to go to the cafeteria. Uh -huh. So it was a great job. I got to do all my homework while I was getting paid. Oh, you know, that's was, good. Yeah, it worked out well. And they were paying me a whopping dollar fifty an hour. Wow. Yeah, the big money. <laughs> so did you get any scholarships then? or? I had a scholarship with the Arizona Republic. I had been a newspaper boy in high school and before that and had a $2,000 scholarship. Other than that, uh, before I went on my mission, I played football in a college scholarship down at Mesa Community College. And mm -hmm. since I didn't have football up there at that time, I didn't pursue that. But uh, I didn't actually use the grant writing, the scholarship avenue, as much as I probably could have. But there weren't as many scholarships in mm -hmm. those days. They were pretty well based on just a few donors. And over the years, that's expanded tremendously, the options there. And the costs were... Relative, and I wasn't remembering. I didn't have to pay rent. I didn't yeah. have to pay for food, and so I probably didn't have the hungry desire to get a scholarship like I could have. Yeah. <clears throat> so, were there like certain expectations at the school besides like the unmentioned grooming code? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was still with the administration, and by the way, there were a few of the administrators who were my high school principal ended up coming here, as, and he was the vice president of my college, Dr. Russo, and there was kind of an attitude that we were kind of a, the 13th grade of the high school, I think. There was mm -hmm. an attitude that we, we, you're lucky to be here, and if you do what we say, you'll do fine. And so that attitude kind of even prevailed into the student government, they were they kind of wanted us to come, they'd come in and present where they thought that student activity funding should go and that we were to stamp it. Mm -hmm. And I remember one big issue was, should we pay for the cheer squad to go to the all the way games and their housing and the cheers and and it was our, it was this, it was student activity funds that were going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So they came and presented it and said we need to have you authorized. Well the student senate voted it down. And that was a little upsetting for the administration. So they came back in and kind of were trying to tell us, and we need to explain, we're going to do it, and you need to approve it. And we didn't approve it. So <laughs> they had just, at that point, that was a, at the end of the year, they just lost the case on the grooming issue. Uh -huh. And legally, they didn't have authority to do it without our approval, so they didn't push it. So we said, I think we can pay half of their way but they need to earn some money and, and earn other ways to do it. Because we said we think those things should go for school, student activity things, like yeah. for, for the dances. We had dances here at that time. So there was kind of the attitude that that uh, even though there were some older students like myself, that they just wanted us to stamp and prove what they were doing. Yeah. And I think that goes back to the, the 60s and 50s mentality. But. I mean, there was a lot of things we did to approve because it was presented well and, and it was appropriate, but but that was kind of the attitude. There was respect. People were, uh, besides the grooming, they were courteous towards each other. Uh, but I don't think it's much different than it is today in your relationship with your professors. I don't think that's changed that much. But I uh, had a few of my high school teachers all came over here, so <laughs> we'd see those. They, they graduated too, so they were here. Mr. Mikowitz, who was a... Uh, Yearbook journalism teacher came over. Dr. Russo, the principal, came over. Uh, Mr. Burns, not Burns, let me think. Yeah, Mr. Burns, the choir teacher, came over here. And I ended up being in his choir, whereas in high school I wasn't. He invited mm -hmm. me to get involved. I was in the band, but he was an outstanding teacher, too. I'd probably put him in my mix as one of my best teachers here. So did the uh, choir travel? Because yes. what they do now. Mostly for recruiting purposes. We went through most of northern and eastern Arizona to the high schools. 
talked about the Alpine College before, the programs here to kind of recruit because, again, it was the first year that there was a campus. Uh -huh. So there was a need to go out and to present what the college had. So we got to do that. And that was a lot of fun. Did you travel yeah. with the Student Senate any or? No, that we just did here on campus. Just there. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, <laughs> let's see. I apologize, I forgot my question. Um, what was like the ethnicity here at the college? Probably the the majority again was was Caucasian mm -hmm. because of demographics of Prescott. There was a percentage of Hispanics who were raised here. Not many African Americans except for those who were recruited for sporting purposes. And many of them came from actually New York area and in the Manhattan Island area. So there was kind of a cultural issue for them. And they would talk to me about it in the, the rec center because they're there a lot as athletes that come and play and eat, and eat lunch and supper. So they, they, I think, had some difficulty going from urban area to a rural community. Mm -hmm. and in fact, a lot of them would only stay one year and then they would move on to another school. Hi. So I think that was an issue. Uh, other than that, there were some older people in classes, and that was good for students to see that old people go to school too. And but I don't. I there was nothing where I would say there was a racial prejudice. There wasn't that the type of division that you might see some places in high school. And otherwise, mm -hmm. people got along. They did well. I think it was just getting used to a new culture for some of those students who came in as athletics athletes. So were there a lot of night classes, or was mm -hmm. it kind of a mix? There was a mix, both night and day classes. And, and so, yeah. I, I mean, I had a typing class. It was on the old typewriter <laughs> there. I was, again, pre-computer time, but, uh, and I did that at night. Other than that, all my other classes were in the daytime. So would you say you were a good student or an average student? Uh, I would say that my first two years, I. Was actually before I went on the church mission, I was a miserable student. I was playing college football and not mm -hmm. doing much of the studying. So when I got home, I spent from that time on trying to get my GPA up to a, a reasonable level. Uh -huh. and, and so I was more dedicated because I'd been gone for two years and grew up. And so I'd say I was a good student, not a great student. And then when I got to my last two years at BYU, I had to really crank it to get my GPA up so I could get into graduate school. Okay. So would you say that YC helped you or would you say it kind of maybe hurt you or? I am a, because of my experience at YC, I, I would say I'm a very, very strong advocate of the community college system. In fact, I encourage my kids, I said, Go to a community college for a couple of years because you don't know for sure what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Don't spend a lot of big bucks and you're going to get the same grades. Just make sure that they're transferable in the state that you're going. Uh, I think it's an, the concept is sound and, and effective for most students. And so absolutely it was a great experience for me. Well, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, as you walked across campus today, um, what were some of the major changes that you saw? I think one is the the in design that's now intentionally designed to help those of, who are handicapped mm -hmm. able to get anywhere on campus. When I was there, it was a lot of steps. You go a level and you go up steps. That, I think, is a huge change. Uh, where the library now sits, there was a parking lot. There was no performance hall. A lot of spaces uh, were empty now are filled with buildings. The I think there, the ambiance is better. I think there's more trees that have grown and matured. It's I think it's it it in design. It's I think it's more friendly campus for all people. And so I think it's a great they did a great job in their their renovation program here. It was pretty. The brick was a stark white. I mean, or gray, <laughs> and they they were squared out, and there wasn't a lot of color around the campus. And uh, I think it was built that way because of the funding, that's what they could mm -hmm. afford and still have a college that would last. And so it did give a good design to build from because now they've got lots of trees to, to fill in the gray. And so, yeah, the campus has been really renovated well. I'm very impressed when I came today. All right. Well, thank you. Is there anything 
else you would like to say? Well, the only thing I want to add is I still see some of the people here that were there when I was there. It's hard to believe. One was a student with me, that's Debbie McCaslin. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've interviewed her yet, but you need to interview her. I'll have to. Uh, she was on the, in the college right. senate with me, and she was Debbie Williams at that time. But uh, she's been here as long as any. I think of, from student to faculty, there's probably no one that knows more about this campus and its transition than Debbie McCaslin. So I'd certainly recommend that. So see people I know, it's uh, always greeted well. They're, they're, the administration here and the faculty, I think, are people who care about kids, and I think the Gaffey College has done a wonderful job in educating students and adults. So, so I'd send all my kids here. If they would choose to go, they all want to leave Prescott, though. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on, but it's a great school. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Tennyson. You're for welcome. Today. Good to be here.